This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Escalating fighting in the Libyan capital pushes more refugees into Tunisia. As Malawi prepares for elections, authorities are being urged to tackle impunity for attacks on people with albinism. And Liberians appeal to President George Weah to set up a war crimes tribunal. Hello and a warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindy Tongana in Nairobi. And with me is Raman Young with a preview of your business news. Thank you very much, Lindy. Here's what's coming up in the course of the hour. South Africa's president hints at roping in the private sector and equity partners in order to rescue ESCOM. And the mining giant Anglo-American is opening Zimbabwe's first platinum smelter. We'll have the details on those stories and lots more coming your way in the course of the hour. For now, though, let's start with the latest in current affairs with Lindy. Thanks, Rama. Well, we start the program in Algeria, where protesters have returned to the streets for a 13th consecutive Friday. The constitutional court that's charged with overseeing the country's transition is expected to release a statement on the election process. There are reports the presidential election scheduled for the 4th of July might be postponed. Protesters have been calling for the resignation of interim president Abdelkader Ben Salah. The Algerian parliament voted for Ben Salah after former president Abdelaziz Bouteflika stepped down. Now, meanwhile, in neighboring Tunisia, the flow of Libyans into the country has continued for the fourth consecutive week following the escalation of the armed conflict in Libya. Tunisia is, in fact, bracing for even more arrivals. Here's CGTN's Adnan Chouachi with more. Tunisian President Beji Qaida Sipsi said the security situation in Libya is alarming. The head of state called on all Libyan stakeholders to sit to the negotiating table in order to de-escalate the ongoing crisis. We cannot claim that Tunisia is going well when we look at the situation in Libya, the war and the killing. We cannot say that the security in Tunisia is stable. Tunisian authorities have inspected border regions with Libya to evaluate the logistical and human resources available in anticipation of a possible mass flow of Libyan refugees fleeing the war in their country. Eyewitnesses have described the situation as exploding in Libya. Armed militias are everywhere. Families are terrified. We had no choice but to leave our hometown and seek refuge in Tunisia. The Tunisian government aims to prevent a potential humanitarian crisis. In 2011, the situation required an international mobilization. Over 2 million Libyans and other African nationals entered Tunisia in less than two months. We welcomed Libyans in 2011. We've opened our doors once again. Libyan families are welcome. There are strong ties between Tunisians and Libyans living on border regions. We share the same culture, traditions and blood. We will not abandon our neighbors while war is ravaging their land. According to the governors of Midnin and Tatawin, the logistical needs and means of intervention were identified to ensure a better organization for hosting Libyan refugees, especially in the Hiba and Ras Ashdir border crossings. Thousands of Libyan families who have fled the crisis in their country have rented houses in the cities of Sfax, Sousse and here in the capital city Tunis. Local authorities assert that many Libyan nationals have registered their children at Tunisian private schools because they plan to live in Tunisia even if the armed conflict ends this summer. Abdel Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Now, from news in Libya, at least 65 migrants have been rescued off the North African country's coast. The German humanitarian organization Sea Watch says it rescued the migrants from a rubber boat that was drifting about 30 nautical miles off the Libyan coast. The Dutch flagged vessel that is owned by the organization is still stranded in the high seas as its crew awaits permission to dock from European nations. Despite the ongoing conflict, Libya still remains the most preferred departure point for migrants intent on reaching Europe. 
Well, Libya's National Army Commander Khalifa Haftar is meanwhile expected in France next week where he'll meet Emmanuel Macron to discuss the resumption of political dialogue in Libya. This comes after his visit to Rome where he met with Italian Prime Minister Giuseppe Conte. Fighting between the LNA forces and the Tripoli government continues, this despite calls for a ceasefire by European powers and the UN. Haftar has accused Libya's government of national accord of supporting terrorism, while the UN backed government sees Haftar's offensive on the capital as a threat to the country's stability. Both sides have been meeting with international leaders to convince them of their individual stands. And according to the UN, insecurity and violence in and around the capital, Tripoli, has already led to the deaths of at least 432 people. Thousands of others have been displaced since the beginning of Haftar's bid to take Tripoli. Well, a little earlier we spoke to Gamal Abdel Gawad, a senior researcher at, uh, and academic fellow at uh, the Al Ahram Center for Political and Strategic Studies in Cairo. He spoke to us about the role of foreign countries in the ongoing conflict in Libya. Uh, it is one issue agenda. The situation in Libya, of course, is there is a, a number of sub sub issues included in that but the main issue now is uh, what is next uh, what is next following the current uh, stalemate in the military front uh, uh, the the khalifa haftar military forces have made an attack on uh, the capital tripoli hoping to quickly take over the capital this didn't materialize a new configuration of forces now is on the ground the uh, uh, Haftar's forces are on the gates of Tripoli, but uh, Tripoli is still uh, quite uh, strong, defending itself. What is the next move here? Uh, what kind of uh, diplomatic effort is needed? Uh, is there a possibility of reconciliation? I think this is the main issue on the agenda when uh, Haftar is meeting with the French president. External powers, foreign powers have played a major role bringing Libya to this to this point, we have to remember here that if it weren't for the military intervention led by NATO, particularly actually by France back in 2011, the current political uh, uh, reality wouldn't have been created in Libya. So the, the, uh, there is the uh, external powers carry a great deal of responsibility over the current chaotic, unstable situation uh, uh, in Libya. Uh, the challenge is that uh, now those uh, external powers are no longer on agreement on what to do in Libya. To the contrary, they are uh, they, uh, they're turning Libya into a kind of a, a battlefield where they try to settle their accounts. This is really a major challenge for Libya now, this, uh, this kind of a negative role played by external powers. Well, uh, oil is uh, the main uh, interest for, for Italy and also actually for, for France. Any, the Italian major oil company and uh, Total, the, the, the major oil French company competing for concessions and, uh, and oil interests in, in Libya. So uh, Italy has a, a very strong vest, uh, vested oil uh, uh, interest in the oil sector in Libya. Uh, Italy also very interested in the political situation in Libya due to migration. Uh, looking at the map, Italy is quite close to Libya. Libya is the platform that is used by uh, hundreds of thousands of migrants coming from sub-Saharan Africa to Europe, uh, just uh, uh, across the Mediterranean and they get to, uh, to Italy. This is a major concern for uh, for Italy there and try, being there is trying to uh, mitigate the problem of illegal migration coming from uh, Africa to uh, Europe through Italy. France, on the other hand, are, are very uh, concerned about the security situation in the Sahel region, which is very much uh, affected by what's happening in, in Libya. Some sort of a comprehensive agreement or uh, deal is needed. However, Europe is divided. The European Union is not in a good shape. There is rivalry and tension between France and Italy over a number of issues. It's not happening, uh, unfortunately, this uh, attempt to overcome the current rivalry between European powers.
And let's go to Burkina Faso now, where Prime Minister Christophe Dabire says the war on Islamists in the northern regions is bearing fruit. He says this comes after the launch of Operation Fire in 2015. The region has been grappling with an insurgency by Al-Qaeda and ISIL-linked groups. In a speech in the country's parliament, Dabire also praised the country's military for neutralizing threats posed by jihadists in the larger Sahel region. Security operations against militants have seen over 200 schools reopen in the north and hundreds of arrests made. At the same time, he defended the military against accusations of extrajudicial killings. Contrary to some organizations that have been accusing the army of human rights violations in this relentless fight against terrorism, I would like to remind you that our national armed forces and internal security forces operate within the framework of the law and our country respects and stands by all the human rights conventions it has signed. The UN Assistant Secretary General for Africa, Bintu Keita, is calling on the G5 Sahel Joint Task Force to ensure it becomes fully operational. Keita made the remarks during a briefing to the UN Security Council. Recognizing the threat posed by militants in the region, Keita also called for the G G5 Sahel member countries to lift the geographical restrictions on the UN peacekeeping mission in Mali. I call upon the members of the G5 Sahel to most urgently accelerate the full operationalization of the joint force so that it can finally reach its full operational capability. Effective operations will send a strong signal to terrorist groups. Their encroachment on the life of the population will no longer be tolerated and will be rejected by the collective determination of the member states of the region. And moving to southern Africa now, political rivals in Zimbabwe have signed a code of conduct that will govern a dialogue process that's meant to foster national unity and a raft of problems affecting the country. Leaders of 18 political parties, including the ruling ZANU-PF, have signed an agreement binding them to respect each other and engage peacefully in talks aimed at resolving political, social and economic challenges that have dogged the Southern African nation since July 2018 polls. It does not serve any purpose to continue in an election mode when citizens are yearning for socio-economic transformation and development. The main opposition MDC alliance, which challenged the outcome of last year's election, did not attend Friday's launch as it insists that any talks must be brokered by a foreign mediator. <coughs> Neighboring South Africa has said it is ready to assist in identifying someone for that role. President Mnangagwa, who has previously said the talks will go ahead with or without the MDC alliance, has left the door open for other participants to join the process. During my inauguration speech, following the 30th July 2018 Amunas general elections, I emphasized that I am a listening president and I will continue to listen. That pronouncement meant that I am committed to reach out to all stakeholders from every corner of the country who are willing to join hands in the rebuilding of our great country, Zimbabwe. Since February, when the dialogue was initiated, four thematic committees have been established and contributed to the Code of Conduct. Farai Mwakutuya, CGTN Harare, Zimbabwe. And let's now head to Malawi, where campaigns are heating up as the country prepares for presidential elections set for May 21st. Incumbent President Peter Mutharika is facing a stiff challenge from a number of candidates, including former Vice President Saulos Chulima, who quit the ruling Democratic Progressive Party to form the United Transformation Movement. Malawi faces a myriad of socio-economic problems. More than half the population live in poverty, just 11% have access to electricity, and the economy relies heavily on agriculture, which is vulnerable to external shocks. Malawi's young population also suffers from high unemployment and job creation has so far been the dominant issue during the election campaigns. 
Another issue, another campaign that's uh, come up, uh, another issue rather that's come up during uh, campaigns is that of people living with albinism. This as ritual killings escalate in Malawi. Most of these killings are linked to witchcraft. Here's more on that. <laughs> For Rose Nasope, the ongoing campaigns bring with them more risk to her safety than the charged political situation in the country. She has a condition called albinism. It is occasioned by a lack of melanin pigmentation. Being a woman makes it even more dangerous for her. I'm a woman with albinism here in Malawi, where the abduction and killings of persons with albinism has been happening so much in the past few years. People living with albinism are being targeted for ritual killings as some candidates believe that their body parts will help them win the various positions that they are vying for. As we are getting very closer to the elections, it's a very, very, very bad time because it's the time when we are very much in, living in fear because we don't know what will happen in the next day because it's very unpredictable that who can be killed and who can kill you. So it's uh, obvious that every day you are living in fear and you are always being in the areas where that we can, you are safe. Ritual killings of albinos in Malawi has been going on for years now. This time round, most political players accuse the government of failing to protect these people. However, changing the society's belief could be the biggest challenge. It's very, very difficult to change the mindset or these misplaced beliefs that you can get rich by using body parts, or you, some of them believe they can be elected into offices by using body parts of these persons. Recently, a man was sentenced to death for killing an albino teenager. Amnesty International reported that up to 150 people living with albinism have been killed in Malawi since 2014. Amy McConaughey, CGTN. Well, time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Liberians appeal to President George Weah to set up a war crimes tribunal. And South Sudanese refugees fleeing into the Democratic Republic of Congo's remote northeast Ituru province. data out of the country. With a dedicated and diverse team of anchors, CGTN now brings Africa to the palm of your hand. I'm Penina Karibe in the heart of Nairobi, which is bustling. From everyday heroes to the continent's most powerful figures, we bring their voices to you. We haven't changed. And this is something most of us are very excited about. We bring you news that's changing perspectives. News that brings Africa to the world. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has denied that two Rwandan refugees who were resettled in Australia were in fact involved in the 99 massacre of uh, eight tourists in Uganda. U.S. media had reported that Leonidas Bimenyumana and Gregoire Nyaminani had spent more than a decade in a Virginia jail over the murders before Australia accepted them last year. Four British, two Americans and two New Zealanders were murdered while on a mission to see mountain gorillas in Uganda. The attack was blamed on Hutu rebels. Well, these are very sensitive matters when you're dealing with any refugee cases and the privacy of those arrangements is always important. Whether you're dealing with Sri Lankan refugees, whether you're dealing with Iraqi refugees, uh, Syrian refugees indeed, or those out of the Sudan. And we always respect the privacy and the privacy of the process 
for those individuals because when you're providing refugee protection then that is an important part of the process and an important obligation. But in these cases, as I said last night uh, on the ABC, on the 7.30 report, these specific allegations were reviewed by our security agencies and by our immigration authorities and they were not found to be uh, uh, upheld in their view and as a result they are allowed to come to Australia. <coughs> Now, in Liberia, citizens and rights groups have launched a video appeal uh, for to President George Weah, calling on him to create a war crimes tribunal. The country survived two devastating civil wars, while a Truth and Reconciliation Commission did take place from 2006 to 2009. A tribunal has never been set up in Liberia to bring those accused of war crimes to justice. Astatal has more. The Lutheran Church Massacre was the single worst atrocity of the first Liberian Civil War. Hundreds of families had taken refuge in St. Peter's Lutheran Church when soldiers entered and started firing. Rufus Carty survived the massacre but still carries the mental and physical wounds. They shot me. But when they shot me, what really blessed me? I dropped. I was behind people when the bullet when they shot me. I dropped. All the other people that they were shooting, they were just falling on me. Falling on me. Saying that thing, I was very helpless. Helpless. That what happened to leave the bullet hit here, it came to leave my body here. Rights groups are now calling on Liberian President George Weah to create a tribunal to try those responsible for human rights abuses during both of the civil wars. In 2006, the country established a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which recommended the creation of a war crimes court. The recommendation has yet to be implemented. The United Nations has released her concluding observation in 2018, asking the government of Liberia to take appropriate measures that will address and ensure the full implementation of the TRC. But with specific quotation on accountability, that is, hold people accountable who have committed gross human rights violations in Liberia. Four survivors of the church massacre filed a lawsuit last year in the American city of Philadelphia against Moses Thomas, a general they accused of ordering the attack. Meanwhile, for Rufus, while the idea of justice is appealing, reparations from those responsible is also important. You do your own experience. You carry your own child to the hospital. You carry yourself to the hospital. A Jewish happy. So even you take the people to court, what will be the saving there for me? See how I'm suffering. Going to court again, one way or the other, it will be another good thing for it. Not to happen for a second time. The Liberian government has yet to respond to the video appeal from rights groups and citizens to create a war crimes tribunal. Astatal, CGTN. The Democratic Republic of Congo is commemorating the 22nd anniversary of Liberation Day in the capital, Kinshasa. President Felix Tshisekedi paid tribute to the soldiers who died in the battle that brought former President Laurent Desiré Kabila to power in 1997. CGTN's Chris Ochamringa has more from Kinshasa. Congolese President Felix Tshisekedi joins a group of politicians and soldiers to mark the country's Liberation Day. This ceremony in Kinshasa was also attended by popular comedians who mimic the DRC's past leaders. It was in 1997 that rebels of the Alliance of Democratic Forces for the Liberation of Congo, led by Laurent Desiré Kabila, toppled the government of former President Mobutu Sese Seko. The rebels were backed by soldiers from Rwanda, Uganda and Burundi. It's a day that the whole country recognizes the sacrifices that our soldiers made to liberate our country. We appreciate the support of all the combatants who joined in the battle, especially those who paid the ultimate price to ensure that the DRC is a better country. President Chisekedi paid tribute to those fallen soldiers. 
ouster of President Mobutu resulted in the change of the country's name from Zaire to the Democratic Republic of Congo. But another conflict broke out in 1998 that sucked in eight African countries. Eastern DRC still has many armed groups operating there, but Congolese forces say they will soon get rid of them. One of these days you'll hear that all those armed groups in the east have been wiped out. Despite this being a day many commemorate, some Congolese feel the public holiday should be scrapped. That's because the conflict also sucked in soldiers from neighboring countries, some of whom committed atrocities in the DRC. This year's ceremony had no public parades or festivals. It was only open to a few government officials and soldiers. Congolese citizens are still divided over the outcome of last year's election. Chris Sochamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Staying in the DRC, South Sudanese refugees are fleeing into the country's remote northeast Ituri province. The refugees who are sheltering in the town of Aru fled fighting along the border between South Sudan and Uganda. Our reporter Daniel Aropmoy has been speaking to the UNHCR spokesperson in Kinshasa. Persistent fighting between government and rebels of the National Salvation Front who have rejected the peace accord is driving hundreds of South Sudanese refugees into the Democratic Republic of Congo. Some of the border areas have also been affected themselves. Even we have seen incursions into Congo by um, South Sudanese um, groups. The United Nations High Commission of Refugees says 554 South Sudanese refugees have so far been registered in the DRC since the start of May. Many of those fleeing the fighting are women and children, including widows, who are in dire need of humanitarian assistance. We need more international support in order to do the basic things for these refugees and in order to um, avoid um, very negative impacts on the humanitarian situation and on the people concerned. According to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, the new arrivals are among nearly 100,000 South Sudanese refugees in the DRC's Aunt Ulele and Hituri provinces. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN. Now across the continent, many people have lost their lives after being caught up in fuel tanker explosions. In Kenya, over 130 people died while scooping fuel from an overturned fuel tanker. Ten years later, some of them still carry scars that remind them of the ordeal. Here's CGTN's Wilkista Nyabo with more. Visits to the Wall of Remembrance are painful reminders of the tragedy which unfolded here ten years ago. The names denote the over 130 people who died on the spot in Sachangwan, deep in Kenya's Rift Valley, after a fuel tanker burst into flames. On the 31st of January 2009, a tanker ferrying fuel overturned by the highway. A section of locals rushed to scoop fuel. Others simply stopped to find out what was going on. When the tanker burst into flames, they were all caught in the fire. 35-year-old Daniel Wekesa survived the flames. I was on my way from the farm and was only there for 15 minutes before the fire started. He had 75% burns on his body, but he recovered. The scars still remain, inside and out. Life was good before. I could find work easily like in hotels. Now people see my scars and they are afraid of me. I don't feel free around people. I feel sidelined. All around Sachangwan are families affected by the tragedy. Some lost husbands, wives and children. Others like 32-year-old Amos Rotich are yet to find their footing. I like to cover my body because I know I'm different from other people. I don't want people to see my scars. If the government, myself included, could set up a business to employ these people, then the survivors wouldn't have so many problems. This memorial was erected in memory of those who lost their lives during the tragedy. However, survivors of the Sachangwan tragedy fear that not enough is being done to prevent similar occurrences. In Sachangwan, life goes on. 
A decade later, the survivors are still picking up the pieces. The wall reminds them every day of their second chance at life. Bulkisanyabwa, CGTN, Sachangwan, Kenya. And let's now go to Ramanyang for your latest business news. Thank you very much, Lindy. Here's what's coming up in business. South Africa's president hints at roping in the private sector and equity partners in order to rescue ESCOM. And a mining giant Anglo-American has opened Zimbabwe's first platinum smelter. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects, just in terms of revenues from taxes alone, $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Business in Africa is at the crossroads, where opportunity meets innovation, where profitable new markets collide with global trends. From the sound of an African bell on a stock market floor, to the shout of the trader in a bustling free market. It's colorful, vibrant and exotic. CGTN stands at the gateway to Europe, Africa and the Middle East. From Morocco to South Africa, we talk to the dealmakers and actors who fuel its engines of growth. Only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Welcome back. Let's start in South Africa. The country's president, Cyril Ramaphosa, says that the fortunes of ESCOM, that's a country's vertically integrated utility, and the country itself are tied together. The debt-laden Paris state has been struggling uh, with the ability to actually put enough power into the grid, and that in turn has dragged economic growth slower. However, a plan has been unveiled to get the state-owned enterprise back on its feet. Here's CGTN's Angela Coppola with the details. A burgeoning mountain of debt gross mismanagement and an ageing fleet are at the heart of ESCOM's woes. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa says there is a credible business plan to restructure and pull the struggling parastatal out of trouble. ESCOM is the only company I think in the history of this country which has worked up a debt of 430 billion rand. So it's a problem that we have to deal with. But in the end ESCOM is just too big to fail. It's just too important to fail. It's just too overarching in the life of our country to fail. It holds the fortunes at an economic level, social level of our country's life in its hands. Ramaphosa has given his assurances that the power utility will not be privatized, but government will enlist the help of the private sector to ease the burden. China, they have been able to bring in the private sector uh, as equity partners in China Mobile and uh, telecoms company, uh, list them on the New York Stock Exchange. And that's the trajectory that we should now be following because there's a great deal of value to be extracted when there's a partnership and collaboration between private sector and the public sector. South Africans who have had to endure power cuts for the last 10 years will have to be patient a little while longer. This is President Cyril Ramaphosa is due to announce the turnaround plan during his State of the Nation address in June. I'm Angelo Coppola for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, according to a Reuters poll taken earlier this year, foreign currency bonds from sub-Saharan Africa are expected to perform better in 2019, despite ballooning debt levels in some parts of the region. Factors like the diminishing prospects for further U.S. interest rate hikes are expected to support demand. Opinion, however, was split on which country would uh, be the biggest improver. CGTN's Ucho Koronko checks in on the winners and the losers in Africa's bond market so far this year. Analysts seem to agree that Africa's foreign currency bond markets will offer better returns this year. Angola, Nigeria and even heavily indebted Zambia have been tagged as key markets to look for value in 2019. That is, after 2018 emerged as a year of disappointing returns, especially for net oil exporters. 
However, the Republic of Congo's dollar bonds have emerged as the best performers in Africa so far this year, yielding returns of more than 15%. Fitch ratings recently upgraded the country's long-term foreign currency issuer default rating to triple C from CC. The government is more liquid thanks to higher oil revenues and there is reduced risk of disruptions to payments of bondholders. The Central African nation has also agreed in principle on a debt restructuring plan with China, a precondition for an international monetary fund bailout. On the other side of the spectrum is Zambia, which has yet to start formal talks with the IMF and agree on better terms for Chinese loan repayments. Yields on Zambia's $750 million of bonds due in 2022 have climbed almost 500 basis points since early February to 17.45 percent. Its 2027 bonds trade at 15.8 percent. Analysts say that yield curve inversion can be seen as an indicator of just how concerned investors are about the situation. The country may be forced into restructuring if it fails to get an IMF bailout or friendlier terms on bilateral loans from China. <laughs> Angola and Nigeria are also offering better returns this year. But like their peers, a lot will depend on the U.S. Federal Reserve's rate trajectory, which of course will determine investor interest in Africa's debt markets. So far, it has slightly veered off its plan for further gradual increases, instead saying it will be patient. While well, traders are saying as the trade war heats up, the potential for the Fed to cut interest rates is now rising, which of course could mean less interest in Africa's debt markets going forward. Uchero Koronkwa, CGTN Africa. The mining giant Anglo-American has opened a $62 million smelter that's going to be processing platinum in Zimbabwe. It's the country's first such refinery. This comes as the country's president, Emerson Mnangagwa, vowed to boost the country's valuable platinum sector. It accounts for roughly 6% of global platinum output. The country is the third largest producer of that mineral after South Africa and Russia. Now, the construction of the company's Unki mine in Shirugui followed government threats five years ago to ban the exportation of raw platinum in order to foster domestic processing. Three miners, Anglo-American Platinum, Impala Platinum and Aquarius Platinum operate in Zimbabwe. The South African country, by the way, is a second, is home rather, to the second largest deposit of platinum group metals in the world. Kenya's largest bank by assets, KCB Group, has disclosed that it will acquire each share of the Lender National Bank at 4 shillings and 19 cents. The figure is a significant, a massive discount, in fact, to the capital starves lenders' book value and market value. In a circular to shareholders, KCB says a deal will be completed by creating and issuing 147.3 million shares to NBK's investors, taking into account the two banks' average share price in the 180 trading days ending in mid-March. KCB's share price averaged about 41 shillings 90 cents over that period of time, effectively valuing this transaction at about $60 million. That it includes the units that will emerge from converting the lender's preferred shares into ordinary stock. For the field now, let's turn our attention to the ongoing trade tensions between China and the United States. Beijing is considering retaliatory measures against the United States after Washington essentially threatens to blacklist Chinese firms like Huawei. The Chinese telecom equipment manufacturer has been caught up in the middle of a much broader trade battle and the race to dominate ultra-fast 5G networks. With the details, here's CGTN's Owen Fairclaw. It's a double punch for Huawei. An executive order signed by U.S. President Donald Trump bans co companies from buying telecoms equipment if they pose a national security risk. Now, while it's true Huawei wasn't named in this national emergency, the U.S. accuses this company of spying on Americans. And it gets worse for Huawei. The U.S. government has decided it now must have a license to buy components from U.S. suppliers. This is critical for its business model, which depends on Silicon Valley chips to fuel its equipment. Now, Huawei says tens of thousands of jobs worldwide are at stake as a result of this. And this move also compromises the US's ability to try and get ahead of the game when it comes to ultra-fast 5G internet. And China's foreign ministry went even further.
We urge the U.S. to stop its wrong practices, create conditions for Chinese and American companies to carry out normal trade and cooperation, and avoid causing more damage to bilateral economic and trade ties. The Chinese side will take necessary measures to safeguard the legitimate rights and interests of our companies. It isn't clear what kind of retaliation China has been hinting at, but it is of concern to many experts that it's now moving from discussions about retaliation over trade into national security. And while China isn't a specific target of this uh, executive order from the United States, uh, the timing has to be coincidental, even though the White House was at pains to say it wasn't. Uh, Huawei is currently at the center of an extradition battle over, uh, over its executive, Meng Wanzhou, who's wanted for fraud charges back here in the United States. She's at the center of efforts by the US to extradite her from Canada. And there's a broader discussion with Huawei about the battle for the future of the internet. The US government wants to use Huawei's rivals, such as Nokia and Ericsson, uh, to build the infrastructure for ultra-fast 5G in the future, uh, rather than Huawei, which it accuses of spying on Americans. It's a bigger problem as well for China right now, because this is one issue that has rare bipartisan support here in the United States. Owen Fairclough, CGTN, Washington. Well, our story for you. A meeting of uh, regional West African experts in biosafety is underway in the Nigerian capital, Abuja. That meeting is reviewing a regional draft policy designed to regulate the application of biotech in food production within that economic bloc. CGTN's Kalechi Mikalam is there. Scientists, policymakers and civil society representatives from the ECOWAS region are here to review a draft policy document on the application of biotechnology. The region is aiming at a harmonized policy on biotechnology. For decades, the ECOWAS region has watched development in biotechnology from the sidelines. But adverse effects of climate change means the ability to produce sufficient food through conventional agriculture is being degraded at a faster rate. And that's why discussing the pros and cons of biotechnology has become very important. GMOs are things that we just, uh, you know, hearing about uh, from different media, international media. But we are, we, we are, uh, we have companies like Monsanto that are developing, uh, you know, some technologies that that are impacting our lives. We don't know real uh, uh, risk related to those technologies. So it is important to have a harmonized view. As a citizen in West Africa, we want to be, for example, when you are a citizen in Nigeria, citizen in Togo, in Benin, Senegal, we, we want to have the same level of protection. The region started exploring safe ways of using biotechnology to improve agricultural productivity and reduce food insecurity in the early 2000s. Ministers from the 15 member states agreed to biotechnology application at a summit in Ghana. But not much success has been recorded. The debate on biotechnology has been a very controversial one. Non-governmental organizations, scientists, farmers and consumer groups who met at a parallel meeting criticized the introduction of biotechnology in the region without proper research establishment of a top-class national GMO detection and analysis laboratory. Others are accreditation of institutions to practice modern biotechnology, granting of biosafety certificates and permits, proper positioning and mainstreaming of biosafety into national administrative structures, development of operational instruments for effective implementation of biosafety and ease of doing business within regulated, within related sectors Etc. ECOWAS strongly believes biotechnology will ensure economic growth and food security among its members. But participants at the summit are also conscious of the potential dangers of adopting it in a rush. And that's why it could take a while before the region passes a final text of a regulatory document. Kelechi Mekalam, CGT and Abuja, Nigeria. I'll be there for the time being. I'll be back at the top of the hour, though. We'll be exploring the potential, specifically the untapped potential, of renewable energy in order to meet Kenya's electricity needs. The details on that and plenty more coming your way at 1800 GMT on Global Business Africa. See you then. For now, though, back to Lindy. Thanks, Rama.
Well, let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Coming up, we take a look at an age-old Ramadan tradition in Egypt, believed to date back more than 550 years ago. Join us in global business and see Africa through our eyes. The greatest journeys. The greatest sights. The greatest adventures. Here in Panatur, this weir allows the locals to walk on water. We're far more than just TV news. We're your passport to the wonders of Africa. To bring you stories of struggle, survival and hope. Ah. Ah. So let's explore. CGTN. See the difference. Africa Live. Find your voice. To South Africa now, where a specialized police dog unit is taking a drug awareness message to schools in an attempt to warn students about the dangers associated with illegal narcotics. It's also part of a sustained attempt to clamp down on drug use and distribution in the gang-ridden communities of the Cape Flats. CGTN's Travis Andrews has more. Mellenberg is one of Cape Town's most gang-infested communities where drug use is a major problem and these kids often end up being the victims. But now the Metro Police's K-9 unit hopes their own version of Paw Patrol will be a big hit with learners. But their show also has a serious message in that there is no place for illegal substances in today's society. They're using the highly trained dogs to show off their skills in anti-drug operations with the hope that word will get out into the communities. If the kids go out and they can spread the message that hey, Metro Police has got these dogs and what, what the dogs can do, it will actually help us even to curb crime because people will be now aware of hey, we can't hide the stuff here, we must move our stuff. The unit consists of 25 dogs who achieved almost 50 arrests since the beginning of the year. But when they're not working the streets, they work in the schools. And with their powerful jaws, they are sending a powerful message. These hounds are quite well trained to also track down firearms, stolen copper cables, and even searching for missing kids. But their presence at schools also act as a deterrent. We've got a program that we come to schools, if they invite us to come and do the searches, that they don't bring um, drugs or any paraphernalia to school. And yeah, just to deter, to be a sort of a deterrent also. They've also done 110 school awareness sessions since last year and the unit believes it's making some impact, especially as a disincentive. This school is one of the lucky ones as the scourge of drugs hasn't reached the classrooms yet. But that's why integrated approaches like this are critical. We talk to them about, about gangsterism and, and drug use and this is just to give them an alternative perspective because you don't know what message they're getting at home. You don't know what they're getting from those people who become role models to them for good or bad reasons. Like any dog show though, there's often a fun component. And with applause and smiles like this, it's easy to see why the city's crack team of four-legged law enforcement officers is such a big hit with the kids. Travis Andrews, CGTN, Cape Town. And now to a story about the Ramadan canon. During Ramadan, Muslims abstain from food and drink from dawn till dusk. And since the 15th century, a canon in Cairo has been fired to mark the breaking of the fast. Our correspondent Adal al Mahri describes the six centuries old tradition. During Ramadan, Muslims anxiously wait for the time the sun sets to break their fast and start eating. And by tradition, there is a sound that has been related to the beginning of that period the Ramadan cannon. That frightening sound is a joy for millions of Muslims in the Arab world. It's the declaration of iftar, the time they are allowed to start eating during Ramadan. 
It's a tradition believed to have begun more than 550 years ago, when a new sultan came to Egypt as the ruler of a great state in the Islamic empire, Khosh Qadam received many gifts. One of the historic tales recorded says a friend presented a canon as a gift to the sultan in Egypt. Delighted with the gift, the sultan decided to try it out. He detonated the canon. By coincidence, it was sunset on a Ramadan day. Citizens in the Egyptian capital were delighted about the concept that they can break their fasting at the same time. It then became a tradition. The canon has been a breakthrough. It made everyone hear the fastings end at the same time, back when no technology was available. And that tradition spread across the Islamic empire. To date, several Arab countries still use the same canon method during Ramadan. The canon used to be celebrated in a match every year when it gets out of the warehouse to be set up for Ramadan. Three people used to operate it, one to load, one to aim and fire, and a third to clean it. Today only one person operates it and no projectiles are installed. This same cannon used to mount Cairo's iconic citadel. Yet after archaeologists' warnings that it could harm the ancient building's foundation, it was relocated here. Today, many people depend on radio and television to know the iftar time, while the caller shouting for the iftar cannon to go off stands here away from any public attention. Adil Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. And coming up in your sports news, up next. The football transfer window opens with Luka Jovic set for Real Madrid. Africa, where champions are made, records are broken, legends are born. We're there for every goal, for every knockout, for every step of the way. Match point only on CGTN. The World Anti-Doping Agency President Sir Craig Reedy has strongly denied the notion that there is a culture problem within his agency. While speaking during the Foundation Board meeting, Sir Craig blamed the tensions of the past two years on the huge pressures that came from the Russian saga at the 2014 Sochi Olympics. The culture within the World Anti-Doping Agency has been good since roughly 1999 it was formed. What made a difference over the last two years, quite honestly, is the huge pressures that came from the Russian saga. And in particular, a small group of people who were passionately involved uh, on issues involving uh, Russian cheating. And that caused widespread and healthy debate within the, uh, particularly the WADA Executive Committee. In my view, no more than that, and maybe it would be expected in the circumstances. But I don't think there's any culture at all uh, of continued disagreement of one group against another group, or whatever it might be. Real Madrid have signed Serbian striker Luka Jovic from Eintracht Frankfurt for $67 million. That's according to reports in German media. The 21-year-old forward scored 10 goals for the German side in their run to the, uh, to the Euro uh, Europa League semi-finals where they were knocked out by Chelsea on penalties and has netted 17 times in the Bundesliga. Spanish newspaper AS said Madrid would officially announce the signing next week after the Bundesliga season ends. Meanwhile, Frankfurt coach Adi Hütter says he would be proud if the move to Real Madrid is eventually finalized. First of all, should that be the case and I'm not the right person, then we have all won. If such a young player is able to join one of the world's biggest clubs from Eintracht Frankfurt, then that's something special and all involved did something right. Of course, it would fill me with immense pride if a player I coached could make his way there. But I believe there's still quite a way to go. But you need to ask our sports director. 
Meanwhile, in Italy, Juventus have announced that manager Massimiliano Allegri will leave the club at the end of the season. In a statement on Friday, the Turin Giants announced that the Italian coach would not be on the Juventus bench for the 2019-2020 season. Allegri has guided Juventus to five straight Italian league titles and four Coppa Italia crowns since arriving at the Allianz Stadium in 2014. Both coach and the club president, Andrea Agnelli, will hold a press conference over the announcement on Saturday. Now, former and current football stars, Ruud Gillett, Samuel Eto'o, Roberto Carlos and Pablo Zabaleta,